There are five structural stability factors that influence the stability of organic compounds and organic molecules. And these are really the concepts that we use to rationalize differences between compounds and molecular structures in organic chemistry. In this video, we're gonna take a deep dive into the stability factors, particularly the first four, and see how they're used to make acidity and basicity comparisons between structurally related molecules. And they're listed here, and we're gonna cover them in order of importance and the strength of the effect. And quite often, if you notice a difference on a higher factor up the list, you don't need to consider what comes below because that that higher factor is going to have a bigger impact than any differences further down the list. Now, there are exceptions to this idea, but as a rule, as an educated guess, as a rational prediction of the relative reactivity of two molecules or two compounds, going down the list in this order is going to be the give you the most bang for your buck, I might say. All right. All right, let's start with the most important factor, which is for charge-bearing atoms, the electronegativity and atomic size of the atom bearing the charge. Which atom bears the charge? This is the question you want to ask yourself. Negative charge prefers to reside on more electronegative atoms, and positive charge prefers to reside on less electronegative atoms. This is highly intuitive if we understand the meaning of electronegativity. So what we're going to do with the stability factors, by the way, is talk about them in general terms, generally at the top of the slide, and then look at a specific example where that stability factor applies. So here, for instance, we've got a compound with two potentially acidic protons, an NH proton and an OH proton, and we're asked which of these is more acidic and why. Now these are neutral acids, right? And we want to think about the ions. Let's remove those protons, generate the anionic conjugate bases, and think about the impact of electronegativity on the anions that result after deprotonation. So let's lose a proton from the OH group to make an O minus, and lose a proton from the NH group to make an N minus. Now we have O minus versus N minus. Oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen, Nitrogen is less electronegative. So negative charge is more stable on the more electronegative oxygen atom. All right, so we can conclude from this that this is more stable than the N minus anion. O minus is more stable than N minus. What does this mean for the acidities of the original protons? Well, here's where the conjugate seesaw comes into play. Because the conjugate base is more stable in the case of O minus, the OH group is more acidic than the NH group. That's the conjugate seesaw in action, essentially, right there. The second most important factor is resonance delocalization of charge or electron pairs. Resonance delocalization of positive or negative charge stabilizes that charge, and this is particularly true in cases when all other things are equal with respect to the types of atoms bearing the charge. So you know, factor number one still applies, but say you're in a situation where you're looking at two NH groups where we would generate negative charge in the conjugate bases on the nitrogens and those two atom types are the same. So the electronegativity factor here doesn't really apply. So let's go ahead and do that, lose those protons, and draw the resulting N minus structure. So if we lose the left-hand proton here, we end up with this N minus. We lose the right-hand proton here, we end up with this N minus. And notice there's not really any difference in electronegativity here yet, right? I've got an N minus and an N minus, so that first factor doesn't really apply. So where do we go from here? Well, we go to resonance delocalization and consider the possibility of alternative resonance forms in which the negative charge is located on a different atom. And if we think about this structure, we can notice that we have the allylic lone pair structure built in, right? There it is, lone pair connected via a single bond to a double bond. And so we can push that lone pair to shift the negative charge to a carbon, to this carbon right here, and this is a good opportunity to pause if you want more practice with resonance and verify that this electron flow does in fact lead to this resonance structure. And in fact, this is not the only alternative resonance form. We can continue to push electrons around this ring to generate other resonance forms. And again, if you want to pause and draw these alternative resonance forms, it's great practice with drawing all the resonance forms of a delocalized anion. All right. If we do this, and we look at all the various resonance forms, you can take my word for it or draw them out yourself, we'll realize that 
in the resonance hybrid, there's negative charge on the nitrogen, of course, but also on these carbons and this carbon. So negative charge is delocalized over four atoms in this anion. On the other hand, let's think briefly about this nitrogen over here, because after all, we want to make a comparison. It's not just about resonance in this. It's also about the difference in resonance delocalization between this and this. Are there any alternative resonance forms of this anion? Well, there are not, because that's a saturated carbon, and the other carbon that that nitrogen is linked to is a methyl group, so there's no possibility to push that lone pair into some kind of electron sink, right, unsaturated atom or group. So no resonance delocalization in that guy, tons of resonance delocalization in this conjugate base. That makes this conjugate base more stable. The charge is delocalized, right? What effect does that have on the acidity of the starting NH protons? Well, that's going to make the proton linked to the nitrogen whose conjugate base would have the resonance stabilization more acidic, right? Conjugate base is more stable and less basic. The conjugate acid is more acidic. That's the resonance delocalization factor in action, and it's very, very important. This is the second most important structural factor as a rule, stabilizing charged species in particular. The third most important structural factor generally is hybridization or orbitals. Klein actually puts this below inductive effects in importance, but PKAs argue against that directly. The funny thing is, I mean, in the PKA table, as we'll see after we touch on this slide, like, it's very clear that hybridization is a more important structural factor than inductive effects in terms of differences in acidity. So in any event, I like to put it right after resonance because it's worth thinking about right after resonance as a structural stability factor. What's the big idea with hybridization and orbitals? Well, hybridization can be sp3, sp2, or sp. So we can talk about electron pairs occupying these hybrids as having that hybridization, an sp3 lone pair, an sp2 lone pair, an sp lone pair. And we can talk about the extent of s character in that hybrid. For example, the sp hybrid orbital has 50% S character and looks most like an S orbital. It's the most compact, the most spherical looking, all that kind of good stuff. There's also an effect on energy here. The S orbital is lower in energy than the P orbital within the N equals 2 subshell, right? P orbital is the highest energy in this series and the S orbital is the lowest energy orbital in this series. And the energies of the hybrids track with the amount of s character. So as I add s character and take away p character, I'm decreasing the energy of the hybrid orbital. Now what effect does that have on the energies of the lone pairs? Well, as the energy of that electron pair goes down, what's the effect on stability? The lone pair becomes more stable. Non-bonding electrons that are occupying hybrid orbitals are stabilized by this additional S character. The hybrid looks more like a lower energy S orbital as we add more S character. This may seem not terribly important and your eyes may glaze over when you see the orbitals, but this has hugely important effects on the acidities of different CH hydrogens. And so for example here, we've got a compound with three hydrogens of interest connected to three different carbons of different hybridization. And so what we're going to do here is, as usual, we're going to consider the conjugate bases by deprotonating and then consider the hybridizations of each of the carbons where negative charge and a lone pair show up and see how hybridization influences the stability of the lone pair and the resulting basicity and applying the conjugate seesaw, the acidity of the original CH bond. So let's draw out the conjugate basis deprotonating here. So here we have this alkenyl anion. We have this alkynyl anion with a triple bond to the carbon and a lone pair there. And then we have kind of our standard sp3 tetrahedral carb anion, the CH2 minus. And so the hybridizations here, we've got sp3. This is our typical carb anion with sp3 hybridization. We've got sp2 here, notice three electron pair domains, one, two, and three, so sp2 hybridization, and we have sp hybridization at this alkynyl anion. 
All right. Now, what's the effect on the stabilities of the lone pairs? Well, based on the general argument we made above, this is the most stable lone pair, followed by the sp2 lone pair, followed by the sp3 lone pair. This means that the sp3 lone pair is the most basic, and the sp lone pair is the least basic. So let's hit that again. This is the lowest energy lone pair. It's the least reactive. This is the highest energy lone pair. It's the most reactive. And this again flows from this S character argument that we made above. All right, so now we can apply the conjugate seesaw and argue that because this is the least basic conjugate base, the CH, the alkynyl CH, the C triple bond CH, will be the most acidic followed by the alkenyl CH, connected to the carbon with sp2 hybridization, followed by the sp3 CH, connected to the carbon with sp3 hybridization. And so this acidity difference, which is quite large, believe it or not, is all coming from the difference in hybridization of the lone pair that appears in the conjugate base. And just to drive this point home, I do want to look at the pKa table to show you the impact of this effect. For an sp3CH, classic example is ethane, the pKa is about 50, we get about 6 pKa units of stabilization when we go from sp3 to sp2. When we go from sp2 to sp, we get an even more dramatic stabilization of something like 19 pKa units. Check this out, in going from ethylene to ethyne, we get 19 pKa units of stabilization. And terminal alkyne protons like this with sp3 hybridized carbons, sp3CH, are actually pretty acidic, way more acidic than we would predict in the absence of an understanding of how hybridization can stabilize lone pairs. Our final stability factor is induction or inductive effects. And qualitatively, inductive effects are kind of like resonance delocalization, but occurring through sigma bonds via the polarization of sigma bonds rather than pushing pi electrons around. And most commonly, we encounter inductive effects in the context of negative charge and electronegative atoms in the vicinity of negative charge or an electron pair. Electronegative atoms that are linked by sigma bonds in the vicinity of a negative charge or an electron pair stabilize that negative charge via bond polarization, essentially by spreading it out through the sigma network as opposed to the pi network. We don't, we really can't represent this with Lewis structures, but we can if we incorporate bond dipoles. So let's take a look at how inductive effects work in a series of related carboxylic acids. So here we have acetic acid, and what we're doing is replacing the H's at the methyl group of acetic acid with chlorines in turn and observing what happens to the acidity. As we do this, it's apparent that the compound becomes more acidic. So trichloroacetic acid is the most acidic in this series, and acetic acid itself is the least acidic. What's going on here? Well, as usual, let's consider the conjugate bases by deprotonating the carboxylic acid group. So I'm going to do that here sort of magically replacing the OH group with O minus and the new lone pair that's added to each of those oxygens upon deprotonation. And now let's ask about the effect of the chlorines on the stability of this anion. Well, chlorine is an electronegative element, so it's going to pull electron density towards itself. So the chlorine in pulling electron density towards itself can share some of the negative charge that's present in each of these anions. Now again, we can't represent that with resonance type electron flow because this is all via bond polarization. But one way to show it and think about it is to note the direction of the bond dipole of the CCL bond and the fact that this makes the carbon here somewhat positive. And that positive charge is kind of attracted to the negative charge here, so there's a bit of pulling of that negative charge this way. It just spreads out the negative charge over the entire molecule. And inductive effects are additive. If we have one chlorine that causes a stabilizing effect, two chlorines will be even better. Inductive effects are additive. And if two chlorine chlorines are good, three chlorines even better, even more stabilization of the negative charge in the trichloroacetate anion.
One thing that's not shown on the slide that we should note, and we'll look at in this example at the bottom, is that inductive effects fall off pretty strongly with distance. When you start getting five, six, seven, eight bonds away from, say, an acidic group, like an OH group or something like that, inductive effects start becoming less and less important. And the closer those electronegative atoms are to the acidic center, the stronger the effect. Take a look, for example, at this compound, which contains two OH groups, and these are just plain vanilla OH groups. No resonance going on because we've got saturated centers next to the oxygen where negative charge is, is going to show up. The difference is we've got trifluoromethyl groups on the left-hand side, and we've got simple methyl groups, CH3s, on the right-hand side. So let's draw the conjugate bases out, as we usually do, and think about these. Okay, well, let's take a look here first. The fluorines are very electronegative, and we've got a whopping six fluorines in the vicinity of this negative charge. So those are very, very strongly electronegative, pulling a lot of electron density towards themselves, and they can share the negative charge that's present in this anion quite effectively, stabilizing the anion by spreading out that negative charge. That's not real, you know, one sort of hand wavy way to think about this is that's not really a localized negative charge because the fluorines have a good bit of the negative charge in the actual structure, even if we can't show that using resonance structures. On the other hand, in the anion on the right, we've got no inductive effects at all, really. We've got the methyls, which are actually, as we'll, you'll touch on much, uh, in much more detail later in your studies of organic chemistry, um, actually a little bit electron donating as opposed to electron withdrawing. They actually push rather than pull electron density to some extent. So with no inductive effect there, basically, um, this is kind of going to kind of be a default O minus. This is going to be very stabilized by the trifluoromethyl groups. And so the more stable anion and the less basic anion is the one near the CF3 groups. That makes the original OH group close to the CF3s more acidic than sort of the plain vanilla OH group without the inductive effect on the right-hand side of the molecule.